So we are interested in composing uh, modularly independently specified language extensions together. And the goal of our work is to enable what we call the modular or the library model of language extension. And so we want uh, independent extension developers to be able to write their extensions and then the end user to be able to decide which extensions they want to use and compose these into the extended language that they are actually going to use. And the key problem that we have to solve here is that this composition where we get our composed compilers done by the end user who is not a compilers or languages expert. And so if that composition process can go wrong, then this is an impractical system. And so we want to solve that problem to make sure that that composition will always work. The general idea of the kinds of extensions we want to do, I have some examples here of extensions we have built for C. There will be more about this on a talk on Friday at Uppsala. Uh, but, for example, we might want to be able to write pattern matching expressions as a new language extension to C. And in particular, pattern matching expression may need to do analysis over, you know, host language to be able to do things like discover the cases, make sure that uh, uh, your patterns are actually covering all the cases and things like that. Um, so we want to be able to write new syntax and we need to be able to do new analysis as well. Uh, so our goal is to be able to extend in both of those dimensions. To some extent, what, what we want here is the best of both worlds between external DSLs, where you do have that freedom of syntax and analysis, uh, and embedded DSLs, where you do have the ability to just import two libraries and use them. Uh, but the key uh, thing that we need here is reliable composition. And so in previous work, we have a number of modular analyses uh, that we can use. So the modular determinism analysis. Uh, is an analysis over the syntax that is being added to a host language that ensures that these new syntactic constructs will not conflict with each other except in an extremely well-defined way, uh, which is the same kind of conflict you can get with libraries. You can import things that have the same name. And the modular well-definedness analysis is also previous work uh, that we have that will ensure that the final compose compiler is a well-defined attribute grammar. And again, these are things that the extension developers are able to apply to their extensions independently of each other and that provides guarantees about sort of the final composed compiler the end user puts together. So just to give you a, a very simple example of a host language, um, on the left hand side we are defining sort of this simple expression language and we're uh, declaring one new attribute, eval. And so we just have two variants in this language. So we have a production or and has the obvious eval equation for that production and the production literal. On the right, we provide an example of what forwarding looks like. And so this is a new production implies. And we say, well, OK, that forwards to what it's equivalent to. So not L or R, That's the equivalent of implies. Uh, and notably, we can but do not have to put equations for all these attributes. Because what forwarding does is says, if I do not have an equation on this production, I can get a value for that attribute by evaluating it on the tree that I forward to. And so eval, for example, would go on this not L or R tree, get an answer, and that would be the value we compute for an implies node. Even with a language this simple, we can demonstrate the problem of interference. So what I'm showing here is two independent language extensions. So on the left-hand side, I have the, a taint extension, which introduces a new attribute that we are uh, putting on expressions called tainted as well as a new production that we call taint. That is an annotation that we can put in trees to say, oh, there's a tainted value in this subtree. And then we can uh, aspect the existing or in literal productions to provide new equations for that attribute uh, that do the obvious thing to discover tainted subnodes. On the right-hand side, we have extension B. Uh, this is a sort of trivial extension, really, uh, the identity transform extension. It has a new, still a new attribute called transform. This is uh, implemented on sort of our host language of two productions that just says reproduce the original tree. Uh, and we have a little node that we can put in that says apply this transformation to my subtree. So this ID production uh, at the top. And just with this uh, simple host language and two little extensions we can put on a slide, uh, we can demonstrate the kinds of problems that interference is. Uh, um, because each of these extensions worked in isolation. There's no tree we could construct that shows anything going wrong with either our taint or our ID extension that those extension developers could have discovered. But the end user who tries to pull them both in can construct this tree. And then we end up with something going wrong here. So we have the ID node and there's a taint node underneath it. But what ID ends up forwarding to is just true or false. 
Uh, and the reason for that is because the transform uh, attribute on taint did not have an equation on that production, so we used what it forwarded to, but it just forwarded to its child, false. And so this taint node kind of disappears when we access this transform attribute. And then what we're evaluating tainted on that transform tree. And so this is, you know, behavior that we want to prevent. And the problem is, you know, these extensions did work in isolation. It wasn't until we composed them together that a problem became evident. And we don't know who's at fault, which extension developer did something wrong, can we blame anyone? We don't even know necessarily what went wrong, right? Uh, there's a bunch of different ways in which we could try to solve this problem if we were doing a whole program solution. Uh, but we want to prevent this problem from ever happening in the first print place. And the approach that we take is to think about things from a verification perspective. So we take uh, extensions as coming with properties that specify how that extension is going to behave. And so, for example, we might want to say, oh, in that tainted extension, uh, the tainted attribute should value to true if, I'm eliding the details, but somehow we specify that this tree T contains a taint node in it. Um, and what we'd want to be able to ensure is that these properties stay true, even under composition with unknown other extensions. Uh, and so, in a sense, we want modular and composable proofs. So extension developers can prove something about their extension, and it's still true even as we compose with other extensions. Uh, and to do this, we do have to constrain extensions, and we hopefully are only constraining them slightly. Uh, but one of the tricky problems that we have to solve is it's not just the proofs of these properties that can become incomplete when we start composing other extensions in, it's their specifications as well. Uh, and so the technical device we introduce in order to solve this problem of doing uh, modular proofs is what we call coherence. And so a co coherent property is one where this is true. So it, the property is equally true of the tree, the original tree, and the tree that it forwards to. And so in a sense, what we're requiring here is a semantic equivalence of forwarding. So you have to actually forward to something that is equivalent to what your extension production means. Uh, and as a starting point, this allows us to complete specifications. Because anytime we introduce a new forwarding production, we have um, a new case for any property that needs to be filled in. And we can say, well, okay, so P of on that forwarding production is just equal to P of what it forwards to. And so as long as the forwarding process is terminating, which is just an assumption that we make, then that is enough to complete the specification and fill in what the value should be. And then we're able to ensure that non-interference happens by uh, imposing two restrictions. So restriction one is that you are not allowed to rely on any properties that are incoherent. So every property you use in specifying the behavior of extension has to be a coherent property. And restriction two is that your extensions must preserve all coherent properties. Um, and so this is enough, you know, you can put these things together and if you're only relying on coherent properties, the coherent properties will be going to be preserved under composition. They'll still be true of the final composition. And that's the general idea of how we're actually achieving this. And so this is something that extension developers have to obey, but they do it so independently, and then all the properties will stay true. Uh, so if we look back at our example, what went wrong with this, we have a precise notion to blame. So it was the taint extension developer who wrote this taint annotation and said, oh, well, tainted is true here, but I'm going to go ahead and forward to something that, where tainted is actually false on that tree up tub tree, and this, these are not equivalent. Um, trees, they have different semantics. And so that is not an acceptable thing to do. Uh, verification, however, is still something we're a long way from doing routinely in practice. And so can we do it without? And so to give you an unreasonable way of going about this, what we can do is require that the values of attributes between the original and forwarding tree are always strictly equal. Um, and so this is enough to ensure that we preserve all coherent properties. There's a proof in the paper. I'm going to skip over that. And it's also surprisingly good at ensuring that, as an extension developer, the properties you intend are coherent properties. Uh, I say surprisingly here because it is always possible, no matter how well behaved in an extension, to write an incoherent property about it. Uh, however, if you obey this convention where these attributes are always strictly equal, any kind of property that you can write a test case for is a coherent property. Uh, so you have to get pretty interesting uh, in sort of admitting the possibility of other extensions and then making promises about their behavior that you can't keep uh, to actually write an incoherent property about uh, an extension that obeys this restriction. 
But this is actually, in, our, in terms of checking this, no longer doing verification to start um, as a simple way of doing the unreasonable approach. This is a syntactic restriction, right? We go to forwarding productions and say the forwarding equation is the only equation. Um, but this is an unreasonable approach. And part of the reason it's unreasonable is because we are requiring the errors that we compute on these two trees to be equal. And so if I write an extension and I say, well, the error messages it has on this tree has to be equal to the generated code that this extension is equivalent to, uh, that's not good. Because then we're giving the user error messages about generated code that they didn't write. Um, and so the usual approach that we used to use to try to fix this problem is say, well, we forward to the translation of our extension but we can also say my error messages are my custom extension errors. Uh, and this becomes an incoherent thing to do. We can no longer allow to do this. However, it turns out there's a very general, very simple way that we can fix this problem is make a very small change to the host language, which is we introduce little error nodes in the host expression language that can host an arbitrary set of error messages. And then as extension developers, we're able to say, well, I can analyze my subtree in an arbitrary way determine if there are error messages. If there are, I can forward to my error expression. And if there aren't, then I can forward to my correct translation. Uh, and so this kind of gets us around this problem, is these, this attribute having to be equal. Uh, and so we can get um, slightly better error messages. But this isn't the only part of the, um, the story because we use attributes uh, to compute these error messages as well. And, but it turns out, uh, this notion of coherence actually works really well for us. So there's a strict equality, which is a sort of normal notion of equality that you would imagine on trees where implies is different from or, and so you don't consider them equal and you can stop looking at things right there. Uh, it turns out to be an incoherent relation. So we can't actually use that in properties. And at first this sounds like a restriction, but in fact it's actually an advantage for us because we can define a sort of host transformation that just sort of applies forward everywhere in a tree, and then show that a coherent property is true of a tree equally of the host translation of that tree as well. And then we can employ this trick, which says, well, I can have differing values uh, between these attributes, these tree-valued attributes, uh, between my host language tree and what I translate to, as long as they are ultimately related in the end. Um, and so you get this kind of commutative diagram, right? If we have a complex numbers extension where we have some extension expression on the upper left here, that can have a new type, the extension type representing those complex numbers, um, where the translation of that extension down to the host language constructs, say, a struct in C or something like that. Uh, and that type rep is something that is different, so this struct complex. Um, as something involved in the implementation of this uh, hypothetical extension. But, so these are two uh, sort of meaningfully different values for these attributes, but they are now related, and that relation makes sure that that's okay to have those different values. Um, so, this is a very useful thing. However, it also turns out it's, so far, this is actually exactly useless. Because if we look at the extension type and the host type, we can say, well, those are different nodes. However, how are we going to you know, observe the fact that these are different? We have to access attributes on these things and get strings or something like that. And those values end up still having to be exactly equal. Uh, so there's one last trick in my toolbox here, uh, which is uh, what I call closing the world of an extension. So normally, what we want to do is preserve all coherent properties so that we aren't um, breaking any property that any other extension may be relying upon as part of its uh, correctness proof. And this is kind of an important thing to preserve all properties because we really don't know what else an extension might need to know about our host language, uh, except with pretty printing. Um, pretty printing is a very simple part of the um, language. It's something where we can pretty much completely specify everything we want to know in one equation, which says, you know, if I pretty print it and parse it modulo forwarding, I get the same thing back. And so we can sort of close the world and say, well, about this attribute, I only want to know this one thing. I don't need to preserve all coherent properties, just this one. Uh, and that's the only thing that we need to know about pretty printing. And this allows us to have meaningfully different uh, values for that attribute, which means that we can now actually make productive use of meaningfully different tree values 
like type reps and definitions lists and things like that. And those values can then be used to uh, produce those error messages uh, that are now, uh, that we're still able to produce custom error messages thanks to those error productions. And this is all we need really to make extensions feel like native language features for the compiler. Um, so this is enough to make your language extension, do your arbitrary analysis, report your errors, and otherwise not notice that this is an extension. It feels like it's a native host language feature. And as a bonus, uh, these kinds of uh, requirements that we're imposing here are simple equalities between the values of attributes on trees. And all of these kinds of things are quick checkable. And so we can enforce this discipline of being non-interfering by just quick checking these properties about your extensions. And if you find places where you're breaking the rules, we can automatically spot that, hopefully, uh, um, without having to do any verification in order to enforce coherence. So we're able to introduce expressive extensions. We add new syntax, new analysis. Uh, we're able to do, uh, we have a theoretical framework for doing modular and composable proofs. We also have a way of, based on that framework of doing testing to enforce uh, non-interference. And this is a, a flexible enough to make language extensions feel like native language features. And really the restrictions that we're imposing on extension developers is just that you must forward to an actually equivalent tree. Which means the restrictions are kind of host language relevant. So our initial example with or and literal and taints, we will, that is the language where we cannot write that taint extension. However, some host languages may have sufficient facilities where you can express something like this is a tainted value in the host language and what you're using, doing with your extension is making use of that in order to accomplish your goals uh, in a more domain specific fashion. So thank you. Um, if you'd like to see more examples of extensions, I'll be giving a talk on Friday at Oopslo.